All right. Thank you so much, Laura. I really appreciate that introduction. Thank you everyone for joining us for this day three of four Lunch and Learns associated with Earth Week. And uh, today's gonna be a great topic. We get to talk about rain barrels today. You've heard about them before. It's free water from the sky. Sounds brilliant. So why isn't everyone doing it? Well, there are challenges with rain barrels. There's opportunities with rain barrels. We're going to explore today whether or not a rain barrel is right for you, for your home, and we're going to find the right way to help you achieve your goals for your home and for your Rouge River. So thank you so much for joining me today. Let me get our presentation going. Oh, and I forgot to do, let me do a screen share as well. Share. All right, I think we should be good to go here. Laura, definitely pipe in and let me know if, um, oh, 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 where's that? Oh, we're having technical difficulties. Come on, everybody, <laughs> come on. I was gonna let you know. This is what I did yesterday too. <laughs> I did so well on day one, and then it's just like, it's just too much to find the right, why is it doing that? Oh gosh. No, it's okay. Listen, Zoom gets, gets us there we all go. in the end. Good. Okay, you got I, think, I think we're live here. All right, all right, problem solved. Thank you everyone for your patience. Uh, here we go, uh, Rain Barrels 101. So we are gonna cover a few things today. We're gonna go over uh, your light intro. So for those of you that are here for the three minute summary, um, we'll go through some of the high level benefits and challenges with rain barrels. After that, we're going to get into a sample site. So one home that has five rain barrels attached at different downspouts, how that gets used, um, how it's worked for that homeowner for the past three years or so. And um, that homeowner is me and my experiences. So um, I'll give you all the background on how it's been working out. And then after that, we'll go through some very common questions and we'll take your questions. This will be our stump the chump opportunity. So, uh, so get ready with your toughest, hardest rain barrel questions and we'll do our best to work through them. And then we'll wrap things up after that and uh, probably get you out of here before one o'clock today. So, um, so intro, rain barrels, some of the benefits. Um, I've highlighted here three main benefits that uh, tend to work for most people, tend to attract people. So one is the free water from the sky, right? It just makes sense. We've got this water that's coming down. It's causing flooding problems. Um, why are we spending money on water when we can just use that free water for our plants outside? It makes a lot of sense. And I think it appeals to a lot of people's you know, sense of environmentalism, sense of frugality. So that's a great benefit. Uh, second, oftentimes people are interested in solving water problems, whether that's water problems at home, uh, water in the basement, drainage problems, or whether it's water problems for our lakes, rivers, and streams. And then the third reason, and this is actually one most people aren't thinking about, but it's a really important and under-considered value of rain barrels, and that's reducing your carbon footprint. There's actually a very high carbon footprint associated with the drinking water coming out of your tap. And so your rain barrel has a very important climate change component to it. So, so those are the major three reasons for doing a rain barrel, and I'm going to step through each one of them briefly here. Uh, so free water from the sky. Um, people ask me, well, how much money am I actually saving here? I've done the math for you. It's typically about five to $20 a year or so. And a uh, typical rain barrel setup is going to cost you maybe 100, 150 bucks, something like that. So there is an ROI over time, depending on how you use your water. And, uh, and that's really the big question is how much outdoor water are you, you using? And um, if you're the kind of person that uses lawn sprinklers, like what I'm showing here, uh, if you're like, me uh, in my own vegetable garden where I would start it and then I would walk away and get distracted by something else and I'd leave it running for an hour. If you're that person, then a rain barrel can save you a lot of money because it's something that you are, are not going to forget. You are there hands-on using it for very small amounts of water. So um, depending on your usage, it can save a fair amount of money. Uh, for solving water problems, I've got the brief orientation here, bad, better, best, uh, about typical water problems and rules of thumb for how to solve them. So on the left side here, bad, 
And this is bad from the vantage of Lakes River streams. It's bad from the vantage of anyone who's getting flooded downstream from you um, is uh, when you've got your downspouts going onto your driveway apron. That water is going straight down into the um, public sewer system or straight into the river. It is what is causing flooding for people downstream from you. So if you've got that setup going, that is no good and you can do better than that. So middle column, the better. Uh, the top picture is showing someone that has redirected that downspout onto their lawn area there. And the lawn, you know, it's not the best sponge. There are better, but it does a decent job. It's way better than your driveway. Um, you could even do better plus plus there, a little bit better still by having a rain barrel in there to intercept 55 gallons, the water that's coming down. So that's an improvement even still. And then on the right side, I'm showing best, and you can see there's a rain barrel in the background there, and it's overflowing into a rain garden in front, um, which is really the gold standard for solving water problems. The picture in the middle shows actually an improvement for lakes, rivers, and streams, but a potential source for water problems in your home. A lot of people have downspouts that let the water out right next to the house, and then the water gets into the basement um, or it starts causing uh, heaving in the foundation. So that center photo might be better for lakes, rivers, and streams, but not necessarily better for your home itself. And so a lot of people are dealing with issues where they need to get the water a little farther away, 10 feet away or so. And a rain barrel can help with that if you're managing the overflow from your rain barrel properly. But oftentimes for people dealing with those issues, a rain garden actually ends up being the best solution rather than a rain barrel or a rain barrel by itself. Um, when you're pairing those two together, that's really the sweet spot, um, the best outcome total. Um, the third major benefit, reducing your carbon footprint. Uh, and I'm sorry to put a, give you a flow chart here, but um, the, the thing that most people don't realize is how much energy it takes to get water to your tap. Uh, and it, it, it makes intuitive sense when you stop to think about it. Water is very heavy and uh, the energy cost of moving water is very high. Uh, it's actually as much as 50% of your city's energy bill goes into drinking water. A lot of that's going to go into getting the water from your water source, whether it's uh, in this study I'm sharing here from the Huron River, from our partners at the Huron River Watershed Council, or if you're in the Metro Detroit area, you're probably getting your water from Lake Huron. Um, getting that water to a treatment plant, treating it, pumping it through pipes, getting it to your house, that's a lot of energy. A lot of energy goes into getting that water to your house. And then if it's indoor water, it's also going into a sewer treatment plant. Um, and if you're in Detroit, actually, um, any of your storm water is going into a combined system for treatment as well. So a lot of energy cost wrapped up in that. If you are using a rain barrel, if you are getting off of city water for your lawn, for your landscape, huge carbon footprint benefit that comes from that. So major value from a rain barrel. Um, if by the end of the talk today, um, nothing else, uh, I'm hoping you all have the takeaway of don't don't do this anymore. Don't these lawn sprinklers are just not helpful for climate change. Um, so whether a rain barrel is right for you or not, you can at least not water your lawn anymore or try to advocate in your community that uh, it's not necessary. It's a waste of energy. It's a waste of money. The worst thing that's going to happen from not watering your lawn is this picture on the bottom right, summer dormant grass. It is okay if your lawn gets a little brown for a little while. And, uh, and the reality is most of the time, brown lawns like that, that's a result of other problems, actually. People not taking care of their lawn properly, not having a healthy lawn. I, I'm not going to get into healthy lawn care management here, but um, know that there's a lot of advice out there about mowing a little bit higher, um, about mowing your clippings back into the lawn, about plug aerating your lawn. Doing those things make it so that even if you don't water your lawn, it's not likely to go dormant. So, um, so whatever you take away, don't water your lawn anymore. Use a rain barrel if you need to water your lawn, but uh, try not to be watering that lawn. It's a complete waste of resources. And I like to think like my little girls, three and six now, 30 years from now, they're looking back at the, you know, the choices we're making now, you know, which choices are they going to say, oh, that was understandable versus a, what were you thinking? I think watering lawns is going to be in the, what were you all thinking category? All right, so now we've got a real quick orientation to some of the benefits of a rain barrel. Now we're gonna think about some of the obstacles for a rain barrel. There's a decent number of obstacles out there that we're gonna get into later on, but I think the one that is the biggest one, the one that most people don't realize um, over our last three years of selling rain barrels at Friends of the Rouge, it's what I've most heard from people that, oh, I wish I'd known this at the start before I bought my rain barrel. The thing about rain barrels is, 
using rain barrel water, it's it's somewhat akin to um, lawn uh, or uh, hang drying your laundry, um, and uh, that that metaphor, that comparison, it holds true for a lot of reasons. Um, and I think it makes intuitive sense for people, right? When you're thinking about hang drying your laundry, we know that's going to take more time, right? Um, you're not just throwing it into the dryer, pushing a button, walking away, coming back in an hour, finding it dry. You're taking your laundry, you're going outside, you're hanging it up, um, and you're getting a huge energy savings from that, a big um, help for your carbon footprint, help for climate change by taking the time to do that, but it does take more time. A rain barrel is similar. A rain barrel is slower. City water has water pressure. You turn that hose on and the water streams out and you can spray down a garden and be done. Whereas with a rain barrel, water pressure is much lower. The water doesn't come as easily. There's a lot you can do to try to make the barrel get higher water pressure, but at the end of the day, it's a slow process. Um, I don't think that this is necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I will say my family does line dry at our homes and we do use rain barrels. And what we've tried to keep in mind that's helped us to make the time to do these things. And I, I have a three and six year old, so we don't have a lot of time is the mental health break of getting outside in nature, enjoying a beautiful day outside. Um, that is got a lot of value. It's, it's worth it to, to decompress to disconnect for a few moments from inside the house to get outside into our garden space, there's a value to that. And that's, that's what's really allowed us to do things like rain barrels, to do things like hanging up our laundry outside. Um, so that's the thing I want you to keep in mind is that rain barrels are a little bit slower. So if you've got a busy life where you can't stop to make time for 20 minutes to water instead of five minutes, a rain barrel might not be right for you. Um, so we've talked about obstacles now. Um, now I'm going to do a quick rain barrel versus rain garden, because this is another really high level question that I very commonly get from folks. You know, do I, is a rain barrel right for me or should I be doing a rain garden instead? Um, I've got a water problem. You know, how do I go about solving it here? So I've got a snapshot for you of rain barrel versus rain garden, and right? They're both good, but they're doing different things and they're, they're meeting different needs. Um, so from the snapshot there, you can see, you know, 55 gallons versus for the 120 square foot rain garden, 340 to 1,000 gallons. Rain garden's going to handle a lot more water. Rain barrel is six months utility versus a rain garden is working all year long. Rain barrel is about 150 bucks is about what our starter kits are running on our website right now. And it's sliding scale. So you can pay a lot less than that. If you're low income, you can pay more than that if you wanna be investing in your river uh, versus a rain garden. And that's a huge range, 200 to $3,000. That's, are you DIYing it versus are you hiring an expensive contractor? So wide range in there. But I think the most important difference between these is really, do you have a use for the rainwater in that rain barrel. If you've got something to water, then a rain barrel is doing you valuable service and it makes sense to do it. If you do not have anything to water, if that rain barrel is gonna fill up after a storm and the water's just gonna sit there without being used, uh, a full rain barrel is useless. Uh, the next time it rains, you're not actually capturing any of the water. It goes straight past the rain barrel and out into your landscape or wherever it would have been. So a uh, rain barrel really makes sense if you've got a water use that it's gonna be supplying. Uh, if you don't have a water use, I will show you a tip. Um, one of my rain barrels, I don't really have a water use for it. So I'll show you coming up a way that you can still get some water benefit, even if you don't have a place to put the water. But that's, I think, one of my best rules of thumbs for you is if you've got a place for the water to go, actively watering, whether it's uh, annual plants and pots, which tend to be really thirsty, whether it's putting that water out in your lawn, whether it is, uh, watering house plants inside, or watering your new native plant garden, or watering your vegetable garden with precautions. We'll talk about precautions for food use in a little bit. If you don't have one of those uses, then a rain garden is going to be your better bet. And the good news is tomorrow is Rain Gardens 101. So uh, if you come back tomorrow, you will get all the down low on rain gardens. So with that, there's our high level orientation to the benefits of rain barrels to some of the common challenges with rain barrels. Uh, I'm gonna, oops, I'm gonna go the wrong way here. I'm gonna move on now um, to our, just a little bit about Friends of the Rouge. You just heard a lot of information from me. Um, I wanna give you a little bit of uh, more information about where that's coming from, and then we'll get back into sample sites, common questions, and wrap up. So um, thank you for joining Friends of the Rouge for this talk. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization. We're based in Southeast Michigan. You can see 
Uh, the white outline there, those are the lands that drain to the Rouge River, four main branches, 467 square miles in Southeast Michigan. The colors on this map are showing land use type. So the red is urban areas. And so it's quick and easy to see that the Rouge is one of the most urbanized rivers in all of Michigan, if not the entire United States. Uh, and so the river's seen a lot of neglect over the years, a lot of pollution, a lot of heavy use um, by virtue of the urbanization in our community. Um, it's a river that uh, many of us have relationships with because it's so urbanized. It's something that many people grew up around just down the street from. Um, many people have a lot of, of um, love for this river. Um, and there's also a lot of negative perception on the river as well. So uh, feel free. I love opening it up an invitation to the chat here. If you want to type in uh, you know, something about your relationship with the Rouge River, please feel free to do so now. Love to see it, love to highlight it. But, um, you know, the river um, with the, you know, um, the river, um, losing my train of thought here, sorry. I've given this talk too many times and I'm losing track of where I'm at, but uh, it's given us a ton. Uh, is what I'm trying to say. It's given a ton to our communities here in Southeast Michigan and to the world. You know, it's the river that birthed the automobile, um, the Ford Model T at the River Rouge plant. Um, it's the river that supported the arsenal of democracy through World War I, World War II. It drew so much, it drove so much economic growth here in Southeast Michigan. Uh, but we all know about the pollution problems that the river experienced as a result from running orange from industrial pollution. Um, I think Ford was dumping about 300 gallons a day of oil onto the river for a period uh, many, many decades ago. And uh, one day that oil caught fire uh, near the Ford Rouge plant. So the, the Rouge River was one of four industrial rivers that caught fire. Um, the Rouge caught fire in 1969. And uh, that was really critical to John Dingle and his efforts to pass the Clean Water Act, which has done so much to clean up the river such that on the photo on the top right, you can see canoe kayak trip um, right by the Ford Rouge plant. So right through the heart of the industrial Rouge River. We've been taking people out on the river for over a decade now. It's been clean for that long. And we now offer an annual canoe and kayak trip. We're also opening up a 27 mile stretch of a water trail on the lower Rouge from Canton down to the mouth of the Detroit River. Uh, at Friends of the Rouge, we believe firmly that up north should not be, um, or Pure Michigan should not be a four hour drive away from us. We should have Pure Michigan right in our own backyard. And that's what we're working towards. That's what our rain barrel talk today relates to, our rain gardens talk tomorrow relates to, our native plants talk, our pollinators talk this week, all of it relates to restoration and restoration that's focused on your backyard. The Rouge is about 50%, the land area draining to the Rouge, 50% single family homes. Our homes are much of our nature here in Southeast Michigan. And so our restoration efforts at our home are really critical to the health, the environmental health of our community. So uh, I thank you for being here, um, being part of this talk, being part of these restoration efforts here in your Rouge River here in Southeast Michigan. Um, I'll add one extra little piece of introduction um, about myself. Uh, Laura did a great introduction, but um, what she doesn't maybe know is that um, I'm originally from Tucson, Arizona. I'm a desert rat. And uh, before I moved to Michigan, I was doing thousand gallon cistern installations for people. My parents have about 2000 gallons of cisterns at their home. Uh, so this idea of water capture and reuse is one that um, I have a deep connection with given my background and one that I've been really um, grateful for the opportunity to bring through my role here at Friends of the Rouge now um, through these, uh, these rain gardens. So um, know that there are people around the world that are doing this, that it is a very common practice in many places, um, but that it's different everywhere we go. Uh, Tucson did not have freezing temperatures to deal with. So it's a little different out here and it's been fun to figure it out through my own home. And uh, with that, I'm gonna get to our sample site now, which is my house. Um, this is what I saw back in 2017 when I moved into my home in the Ann Arbor area. And uh, for those of you that have been the previous talks, you've seen this. Um, I, uh, you know, I was a little bit surprised to see that water back there, but uh, I also felt pretty confident that I could figure out how to manage it. Uh, it kind of is my job. Uh, so here is what I did uh, after year one. I built a couple of rain gardens down where that ponding area was. Um, I also built some native plant landscapes. So right up here in front was a new native plant landscape. And you can see in progress here, cardboarding around my apple tree um, to create another native plant landscape. So that was sort of in progress. And then here was after the following year, 
Um, when I got that done, I also ended up ripping up about 300 square feet of asphalt over here in my driveway, making another rain garden. And right now, this year's project is taking down that trumpet creeper, taking down this chain link fence. So I'm really opening up my yard. Um, so I'm making it a space that is much more pleasant for my family to be in than it ever was before. I've dropped my lawn space by as much as 50%, but I still have plenty of space for my kids to run around and play in. And the reality is that my girls are having way more fun actually playing around some of the hiding spaces. I've got some sumacs over here that they love to hide under. Uh, so the landscape has become much more open to them as a play area with much more interesting things to discover and explore than ever before. Now, right under this, oops, um, mouse over here, this section of roof right here, the bottom left corner is where there are some rain barrels hidden. And I'm going to show those ones next. So here is that corner of my house. Here's that new native plant landscape. That was the first one I installed at my house um, with a service berry there to share, shade my air conditioner over time to make it more efficient. And here you can see three rain barrels. And those rain barrels, I'm gonna go back up. My vegetable garden is right back there. So I've got three concentrated in this back corner to provide a whole lot more capture and storage for use for that vegetable garden right there. So moving forward again, here you can see that setup. And uh, the top left, I've highlighted some of the pieces that went into this. I've been trying to experiment with some different options, different ways to manage so that I can report back to you all about my experiences. So for this one, I ended up um, raising up the rain barrels using concrete blocks. And the reason to raise the elevation on your rain barrels is so you get more water pressure, basically. So going back, my rain barrels right here are about 50 feet away from the gardens themselves. That is, that is some distance. The farther away you're trying to send the water, the lower your water pressure is going to be. So ideally, you're going to get your rain barrel located close to where the water use is going to be. And then hopefully you'll also have additional elevation. And I fortunately do, actually. If you go back to that first picture here, you can see the low part is over by the vegetable garden. So I've got a decent run that helps me to get the water over to my vegetable gardens to use. Um, what else do I have going on here? I use the earth-minded diverter, which is pictured on the bottom left here. Um, you can see it right there. You drill a hole into the downspout, insert that in there, and then it captures the water and brings it over into these rain barrels. And they're all linked together. The water gets into this first barrel and then it travels to all three of the barrels for use. Um, the other thing I'm gonna share is um, I ended up putting this little, um, they're called gutter balloons up top um, into, um, uh, the top of my downspout up there to keep leaf debris out of this system. And um, I, I didn't know whether that would work. I didn't know how it would work. My experience with it has been that, sure enough, it keeps all the debris up in the gutters. And um, I just have to be on it, cleaning the gutters out up there. Thankfully, my gutters are not very high. So I've got a short ladder to get up there. Last year, I tried removing it just to see what would happen if I didn't have that screen in there. And by the end of the season, <laughs> my uh, downspout had clogged all the way to the top with leaf debris, uh, which has been a huge pain to get out of. So for this earth minded system, I, I'm going to definitely put that balloon back in there so the debris is up top in the gutters and easier to access. Um, the debris clogging was not pleasant um, in this earth minded system there. So uh, that is, um, that's the one system there, that's my back. Now I'm going to move forward to the front of my yard and there you can see my uh, three and six year old playing around one of our rain gardens. Um, that I built last year. And you can see over by where I'm standing, another one of my rain barrels. For this one, I ended up using the wooden stands that uh, are available in the Friends of the Roof store. And one of the things I learned, I actually did this one first. Uh, I hadn't thought about it when I bought it, but that it's, it's a little difficult if you're putting it onto a landscape area, an earthen area, having those four platforms to get it level. I was worried with my clayish soils that it would end up leaning a little bit over time. So I ended up having to do a fair amount of subgrade management. I ended up putting a tile down, um, like a stepping stone, basically, to have something firm for this to stand on. So I do think these wooden stands tend to work better if you're putting your rain barrel onto concrete or asphalt. Um, I did like the concrete blocks as something a little bit more sturdy for a uh, rain barrel placed on um, soil. And uh, for this rain barrel, I ended up using the Fiskars diverter uh, pictured on the right here. And I will say I, I do like the Fiskars. It has not clogged up. Um, I did remove the um, balloon from this one as well. And I didn't have the same clogging issue as much. It lets debris flow through it more easily. Um, it does have a bit of a design flaw where you have to be a little bit more um, familiar with using caulk, especially as a tool um, to be able to install it. I had to uh, apply a caulk seal underneath it to make it seal properly. So they've got a slight issue with their design that I had to work around a little bit, but it was also fairly easy to install. Um, and I will say all of these systems that I installed here, if you're um, 
comfortable using a saw, taking measurements, basic measurements um, with rulers, uh, then they're very easy to install. And for this one, I had to use some caulk as well as an additional thing. Um, and so what you don't see on here, I, I need to take a new picture of it, but um, this rain barrel overflows now under my porch and um, into a catch basin over here that then flows into the rain garden. So this rain barrel, when it overflows, ends up feeding this rain garden as well over here. And I actually have a rain chain extending down um, that looks really nice actually on that side too. Um, this is my last rain barrel, my fifth rain barrel. It's on the other side of my house. And this is a good example of a spot where this is my biggest water problem for my creek system. I live near Mallets Creek, uh, which is a pretty um, poor health uh, tributary of the Huron River. This downspout um, outlets pretty close to my um, asphalt apron, um, that, which then the, goes pretty quickly into the river system where it's a flooding problem and an erosion problem. Um, and so for this rain barrel here, this rain barrel is helping to solve that issue a little bit. This is also my rain barrel where I don't, I don't have as much of a use for the water though. And so what I do for this to make it so that the rain barrel still has some value, I ended up putting in a double um, spout and um, I have the left one open basically, just a little crack. So it's just dribbling out and I've got a little hose attachment to it. So it outlets over a little farther away. So after a rainstorm over about three or four days, this thing will basically drain out and empty. So then the time, by the time the next rainstorm comes along, my rain barrel is empty and it can fill up again and grab the water. And then over three or four days, it slowly empties out again. In that time, if I want to, I can try to tap into the water to use it. But again, I just, I just don't have as much use for the water in this space. So, so that's an example for how, if you're in that situation, you don't have active uses for the water, but you still think a rain barrel makes sense for you. If you have it draining dry over the course of three or four days, that can help. All right, so that is uh, my site there. And um, let's, we should pause for some Q&A here. I'm sure we've had some questions here. Um, I'm gonna focus the Q&A on the intro that I gave, and I probably should have taken Q&A at that time and on my sample site. Um, after that, we'll get into the common questions. So just general questions, um, I, will, I will answer at that time. Um, so feel free, Lara, if there's any questions. Oh, and you know, I forgot to look. Diane Rushlow earlier shared some of her favorite things about the Rouge, hiking, kayaking, snowshoeing, frogs and toads, birds and forest animals. We do have some great natural areas here in the Rouge uh, with a, a healthy abundance of wild creatures. So thanks for highlighting that. Um, I've got two questions here. Um, only one of them relates so far to what I just shared. So George, I'm gonna get to your question about water quality later on. And um, Elisa, or Lisa, sorry uh, if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, about rain barrel use during the winter time. Um, Lisa, and I'm not going to get your last name right, so I'm not going to try, um, asked if it's okay to throw mulch over the cardboard right away. Um, for those of you that were with us yesterday for our talk with Vern um, Stevens of Designs by Nature, um, you might have caught Vern and I having a little bit of a like, well, in my experience, it's worked great. Well, in my experience, it's a terrible idea. So I'm trying to get more information from Vern about the cardboard method here. But for me, it's worked very well. I used it for the rain gardens over here. I used it for this uh, native plant garden over here. I used it for this garden over here. Um, and um, I ended up um, for the garden down here. I put it down over the course of the winter time slowly as the winter proceeded, as the cardboard came in, I slowly uh, covered up this area. And then in the spring I put mulch over it and then I waited until the fall to plant. Um, so I ended up having some space before I planted, which I think helped the cardboard to kind of break down a little bit. It helped to really kill the grass, like after the grass being under the mulch for a couple months or so, I think it helped. Um, some of my other gardens, I put the cardboard down and then I covered it with the mulch immediately. Um, and then still though, I waited a good month or so before I ended up planting to let the cardboard sort of um, break down a little bit to help it smother the grass underneath it. So, so if you're thinking about doing native plant landscapes, and I will say, I think this is very topical for a rain barrel talk. Um, half of why I got these rain barrels over here was I was planting all of these plants and I did not wanna to have to use city water to support them. So uh, those rain barrels in my back area um, kept all these plants alive um, in all of these, um, these native plant gardens here uh, through their first uh, year of life. Um, let's see, so answered that one. Um, do hey, folks- Matthew, Yes. You have a couple of questions in the chat. In the chat, let's see. It's the very bottom. 
question from Facebook. Can you please speak a bit about how much of a benefit it is to use rain barrels if you aren't on city water and instead are using well water? Oh, that's a very interesting question. So with well water, there's not nearly as much energy use. It's going to go into the delivery of the water into your home. And then presumably you're also on a septic system. And so there's not nearly as much energy use that goes into the management of um, your sewer water. Of course, you know, any water you're putting on your landscape is not necessarily going into your septic system. So I would say as a generality, I've not seen a study on this, but as a generality, if you're on a well, your carbon footprint is going to probably be less for your water use than if you are in a city water system. Um, that said, there still is a carbon cost associated with pumping the water out of your well. And so there's still a benefit to, if, you, if you're using water outside um, or if you're using water on plants in general, to um, using a rain barrel to capture rainwater and use that rainwater instead of your well water. Um, so I think, I think that should cover it, although feel free if I missed anything with that to follow back up. And then Barbara asked about mosquitoes. Michael asked about uh, frequency of cleaning. So we're going we're gonna to hold off on some of those questions because I'm going to get to them in a little bit when we get into the common questions. Um, and I will go back through the chat and the Q&A to make sure that I cover those ones if I, if I skip them for some reason. And uh, Deborah asked about issues with municipal rules and HOA boards. We'll get to that one as well. All right. I'm going to move on back into presentation now. Where were we at? We were at common questions and your questions. So I'm going to run through some just common questions uh, first, and then I'll get to your questions specifically. And to do that, I'm actually going to take us to a website uh, because I have tried to get a lot of answers to common questions available on our website. Um, and uh, I fortunately have it open already. Um, so from the Rouge store, you can get to learn more about rain barrels and you click on that. I've got rain barrels 101 on here, which captures a lot of the information that we've shared today, although uh, we shared a lot more um, there uh, or, or here than what I've shared on this website. Um, I'm going to just kind of work us through some of the stuff that's on here. Um, I often get questions about the different kinds of rain barrels that are out there. What's the best kind of rain barrel? Um, and I don't think that there is a best kind of rain barrel necessarily. I think it's going to be what works for you. I think that you should make sure that the rain barrel that you pick is going to be one you're happy with. Um, that excludes mosquitoes uh, is the primary public health concern associated with rain barrels. Um, and uh, that's, that's the primary thing. So here I show um, three of the major kinds that are available. Um, the upcycled chipping barrels that Friends of the Rouge is carrying. Um, wooden barrels are also available, which are much more attractive, much more expensive. Also, you got to be careful. Some uh, are decorative, not functional for holding water. So to make sure you're getting the right kind. And then lastly, there is a wealth of options for just manufactured plastic barrels out there. So you can pick your style, you can pick your color. Um, I will give the caution, we'll talk about mosquitoes in a little bit, that some of the manufactured barrels do not always do a good job paying attention to the mosquito issues. So um, definitely a buyer beware on some of those options. The upcycled barrels that we get, part of why we opted to carry these ones is because they do a very good job excluding mosquito through their design. Um, so, and we'll talk more about that with mosquitoes. We already talked about saving on your water bill, so I'm going to skip that. We already talked about that. Um, how to water with a rain barrel. We've talked about this a little bit, but um, a little bit more information. Um, I have had great success using five-gallon buckets with mine. I've got my barrels raised up high for water pressure. It allows me to put a five-gallon bucket under there. That's how I ended up watering the like 20 new shrubs and trees that I added to my landscape, um, was using... Um, a five gallon bucket for my little perennials. I did use a hose, um, just a little bit easier to control the water flow there. And um, raising it up high for that water pressure helps immensely. Um, soaker hoses don't tend to work very well because of the low water pressure. Um, I have not heard from anyone that has tried it though. I would be very curious to see if maybe it's slow, but if it still actually will drain over time because I could see another great way to potentially use up the water in a rain barrel would be just having it running to a soaker hose in a garden um, and just letting it slowly drain out over time. So I'd be curious if somebody wanted to try that. I haven't tried it yet. Already talked about how to best help the river. Um, sizing linking barrels. So uh, a common question that I get from folks is you know, how many rain barrels make sense at, um, at my home? Um, the reality is these rain barrels are almost always too small for your downspout. 
Um, on a 375 square foot of roof, a quarter inch of rain is going to fill up a standard rain barrel. And uh, as I'm sure you've all seen, we're oftentimes getting larger than a quarter inch rainstorm. Um, and so it often makes sense to link more than one barrels together or to make sure that the barrels have an overflow that's going to work uh, appropriately for you. Uh, and that's actually part of the reason why I really like diverters um, is that they do a better job managing the overflow. When your rain barrel is going to fill up, um, the water will effectively go away from the home. Um, I thought about moving on. I've got installation tips over here. There's a million questions about how to install these things. And it's really hard to give people good installation tips because there are so many different systems out there. Um, and so really the best rule of thumb is gonna be read the directions very carefully on the system you've got. Um, so this is a video on our website. Um, I may or may not show it. I'm gonna see how we're doing with questions. Um, if we get through questions and we've got some time, maybe I'll show the video here so we can watch it together and talk about it. Um, she does show some really good pictures of what happens if you don't have a downspout diverter. So I do recommend taking a look at it. The other video I'm going to draw attention to here on our website is um, a funny video in Australian accent reviewing uh, 10 best diverter systems. My bet as to why it's an Australian doing this is that Australia is way ahead of us in water capture um, just because of their desert climate, their high droughts. They, uh, they need to be good at doing this. And so uh, I think that's why that's happening there. But so for those of you that have questions about what diverter to get, I would recommend watching this video in addition to what I shared about my experiences with diverters. And I should have mentioned actually that on our website, um, Upcycle does have a diverter system that they provide. And it is very similar in makeup to the earth-minded system that I shared. It functions pretty much similarly, um, functions well. Uh, it's more susceptible to clogging than, than some of the other systems out there. So these are resources and uh, maybe we'll watch them if we've got time, depending on questions. We've got some tips out there. I wanna get into mosquitoes though. So mosquitoes are one of the biggest questions that people have about rain barrels. And mosquitoes are tricky in relation to rain barrels. Um, there are a number of rain barrels that are available out there. I mentioned this, um, a lot of the pre-manufactured ones that do not properly exclude rain barrels. You can see the picture on the bottom here shows rain barrels with big open screens or holes drilled into the top, wide holes. These are mosquito magnets. Uh, for a barrel to exclude mosquitoes effectively, it needs to have what is known as a fine insect screen on top. That is smaller than a standard window insect screen, um, which mosquitoes, if they're really, really uh, motivated, they can, they can sometimes squeeze through those. And so um, the upcycle barrels that we carry do use this fine mesh screen. If you're doing a DIY rain barrel and all you've got available are the standard window, window insect screens, the recommendation actually is to get two sheets overlay them sort of like offset from each other so you get an even finer mesh out of it. So if you're buying a rain barrel online and it doesn't have that, that's a problem. Um, if you do have a barrel like that, one way to fix it is by just adding decorative rock up top. If you can get it like two inches thick or so, that will typically fool a mosquito. So they think it's ground. They don't realize that the water, uh, that there's water underneath. So that's a, a way to potentially work around uh, issues if you end up with a rain barrel that's got a, a poor design on there. What I strongly encourage is do not rely on mosquito dunks. Uh, there are folks out there that will say, ah, it's no problem, just keep adding mosquito dunks in. The reality is those dunks only last about two weeks and you will, I guarantee, forget at some point. So it's really good to have a rain barrel that is designed to exclude mosquitoes, not one like these pictured below that would rely upon you actually adding those dunks in. So, so that's my, my quick 101 with mosquitoes. There are other potential issues with mosquitoes in relation to rain barrels. If you install it incorrectly, uh, it's possible that the water will actually brim above the top of the screen. Um, if you see it doing that after it's full, if the water level rises above the screen, then that's potentially risking mosquitoes. You'll just need to raise the rain barrel up a little bit at that point to try to avoid that. Um, uh, those are the primary concerns with mosquitoes that we've seen. So, so if we ever had the mosquito question, that is my answer. Somebody else had a question about um, municipal code as to whether or not these are legal. And um, I get this question every year. Um, and I get it from a lot of people in a lot of different communities. Um, it is legal in every community in Southeast Michigan that I'm aware of. Uh, every time I get a resident that said it's not legal in my community, I've checked with um, the um, codes and ordinances officers with that community and every one of them has said it's legal. Uh, so there's not an issue with rainwater collection anywhere in Southeast Michigan that I'm aware of. 
Um, really, countrywide, the only place that I'm aware of that's ever really had a prohibition against rain barrels was Colorado, and they actually changed that not too long ago. So generally, rain barrels are legal. Um, there are a few places where I have gotten reports of people that have been ticketed in the past 20 years or so, not recently, for rain barrels. And uh, what I've been able to determine is that in every situation, the ticket was not for the rain capture, it was for creating a nuisance. So most of the time, it's for DIY rain barrels where people are not um, excluding mosquitoes and they end up getting a pest issue with mosquitoes. That has been what people have been getting ticketed for with rain barrels. So if you are buying a rain barrel like the upcycle barrels that we carry that exclude mosquitoes, then you should be in great shape. All right, uh, last uh, common question I'm gonna get into is food safety. And then we'll go back to the Q and A. We'll go back to the stump the chump. Uh, we will see, you throw your hardest questions at me and we'll see how well I can do handling them. So food safety uh, with rainwater, this is a very big question. And a lot of organizations have taken different tacks um, towards it. So uh, our partners with the Huron River Watershed Council, for example, their tact is to just flat out discourage use of rainwater on food plants. Um, from a precautionary principle perspective of basically, if in doubt, don't do it. So if that's sort of your uh, approach to life, then, then you might wanna be cautious just in general with this. Um, more information though, to help you weigh the pros and cons of this. Um, there is an article that we uh, reference down here with the Sightline Institute uh, that um, goes over research on um, safety of water captured. And I've summarized it basically right here. If your roof is a wood shake roof, do not, do not use rainwater on food plants. Um, there are gonna be enough heavy metal toxins that come out of those kinds of roofs to make the water toxic for people. So do not in that situation. Um, if you have a metal roof, then in most cases, you should be in pretty good shape. If you have an asphalt tar shingle roof, then you are also generally in good shape with precautions. The general precaution basically is to water the soil, not the plant, not the part that you're eating. So for example, if you've got a tomato plant, this is a great plant for, um, for rainwater, water the soil around the tomato plant, do not spray the plant down, do not water the tomato itself. Um, and with that, the soil typically is gonna neutralize any issues, um, any of the, the stuff that's coming off of the asphalt tar shingle roof, uh, and you should be good to go. So this means basically don't use rainwater on um, crops like radishes, turnips, beets, potatoes, below ground edibles. Those are gonna be not so good to use with um, water from an asphalt tar shingle roof. Uh, with a metal roof, um, the one thing you're gonna wanna keep in mind is that there's still like bird poop uh, on your roof that's gonna be getting into the water. So there's still a potential E. coli risk in the rainwater. And so you might wanna be uh, especially precautious uh, with that and still water the soil itself. Um, or maybe you're gonna just wash your produce diligently. Um, or if you're really into this, um, there are systems called first flush systems out there. And uh, I actually have seen one that's just an off the shelf. You can just buy it and plug it in now. Never used it, can't vouch for it or not. Um, there are a lot of images out there for DIY homemade first flush systems. Um, I might do one at some point for my home. Generally what I found for most people is that they just don't see the reward in going to that much effort for their rainwater. So most people in the Michigan area have not really bothered to do something like that. But the basic principle with a first flush system is um, that first you know, a um, couple minutes of the storm, that's where most of the dirty stuff gets washed off of your roof. And so if you've got a first flush system, it basically pulls that water aside, keeps it out of your rain barrel, pulls that dirty water aside, and then cleaner water goes into your rain barrel. So, so that's a, if you're really excited about trying to use rainwater for a vegetable garden, um, especially if you're doing a large vegetable garden with um, a large water source, a first flush system is a, a good thing to do. Um, my favorite example of that um, is actually, it's a Tucson example. Um, the community food bank in Tucson, um, I was working with them at the time. They had about a 2000 square foot food garden. We installed a 20,000 gallon cistern to gather wa uh, water off of their massive, um, warehouse structure uh, to use in their, their, their farm, actually. It's like a mini farm that was getting watered by rainwater. So there are great examples out there of, um, of using rainwater on food gardens, but you need to be cautious. You need to be aware of what's coming with the water. So for most people, if in doubt, it's probably gonna be better to water um, you know, your native plant garden as you're planting it. Hopefully it will never need water again after that first year or watering your lawn, um, watering houseplants, watering annuals outside in pots. 
those kinds of things rather than food gardens, if you're in doubt. Uh, so with that, I am going to stop the screen share and let's just see how we're doing with the Q&A. If you've got any good Stump the Chumps, I'm going to review um, some of the questions and see if I answered them all. Laura, please feel free if you see a question um, on the Facebook to let me know. Um, George asked about the water quality from an asphalt shingle roof, which I think we took care of that. Elisa asked about any uses for rain barrels during the winter time. God, that's actually, that's such a common question. I need to add it to our website because there's a lot of mixed advice out there about what to do with a rain barrel in the winter. If you watch that video that I shared, uh, that's it's a very good example of uh, the most precautionary thing that people will do. Um, a lot of people will say basically in the fall, you need to unhook that rain barrel. You need to bring it into your garage. That I don't like, I mean, it takes a lot of space up. I'm not really happy with that. And it's a little bit more work. Um, so the next best thing that they'll say is to unplug it and then flip it upside down. So that way it's not getting water in it. I don't like that either because it blows over. The barrel can get damaged. So um, I actually do what Upcycle recommends, uh, the manufacturer that we carry. And that is uh, that I disconnect the rain barrel from my downspout diverter. So after it's disconnected, the water just goes down the downspout like it used to before I install the rain garden. And I just leave the rain barrel there. I open up all the spigots. And what happens basically is throughout the winter time, um, whether it's rain due to our warmer Michigan winters or snow, um, you're going to get water in that rain barrel. It's going to fill up about the bottom inch or so of the rain barrel. And then when the temperatures warm up and it melts, it's going to overflow out the open spigot. And then when it freezes again, that bottom bit of freezing, it's, it's not enough to cause a cracking in the rain barrel. Um, and I've gone through three winters now without any cracks in my rain barrel. So I'm pretty confident of this at this point. Um, and so that's, that's been the easiest thing for me is I just, I just disconnect it from the downspout. I open up all the spigots um, and I leave it sitting there all winter time. And that's low maintenance for me. I still get to see my rain barrels, which makes me happy. I'm constantly looking ahead to spring. Um, very easy for me. Um, other than that, though, I am not aware of any use of a rain barrel during the winter time. So uh, if anyone has one to share, that would be great. But that's, that's ultimately one of the challenges with rain barrels in Michigan is that it's only a six month of the year practice at best. Uh, and that's why rain gardens end up oftentimes being a better practice for many people that have water issues that they're trying to solve is that the rain barrels do not help in the winter time. Um, Deborah asked about municipal rules or HOA boards. Um, I kind of got into that with municipal rules. I didn't touch on HOA boards though. I, I have no experience at this point with people navigating HOA boards and what those rules might be. So I would encourage you to check with your, your HOA board, check with the rules uh, before you go ahead um, to, to see you know, what, if any, prohibitions you might be experiencing. And uh, if you're not allowed, you know, that might be a good advocacy point there. Um, but I do not have any experience I can point to. Uh, next, we've got... Um, Anonymous attendee, I am under the impression that Ann Arbor charges homeowners for water that drains into the storm drain. And if we get a rain barrel, how do we connect with the city to modify our water utility charges? So that is accurate. Um, I am an Ann Arbor resident, so I have personal experience with this. Uh, but I will uh, expand upon this to say that uh, there are similar practices in place in Royal Oak. Um, and uh, in the city of Detroit-ish, you get charged in the city of Detroit for the water that's draining into the storm drain. I'm not sure whether you get a credit for rain barrels though um, at this point. My guess is actually maybe not uh, in Detroit. Uh, for the long term, our hope, our goal is that most communities offer services like this where you can get a discount on your water bill by having rain barrels, by having rain gardens. It's likely to be the future. There are some state law challenges right now that make it difficult for some communities to do that. But most communities want to move that way. And uh, the more that you are empowered and um, knowledgeable about stormwater issues and able to advocate, the more likely that we're going to get there. Um, so oh wait, anyway, so how do you do it, though? Um, check the Ann Arbor City website. There's going to be directions for how to do it. I think it's I, I think it's you email Jerry Hancock and let them know you've got one. And that's pretty much it. So but check their website. They might have changed those uh, those requirements. Um, Rochelle Bono, is there a shelf life for the water in the rain barrel? That is a good question. Um, standing water as it gets warm uh, potentially breeds algae, 
um, and becomes a nuisance. So generally the advice out there is to try to use that water up. Um, that said, uh, I, you know, may have left the water standing in uh, some of my rain barrels for a long time last summer, uh, and I actually didn't notice any issues. So there are some other considerations. One is where have you sited the rain barrel? Is it in the sun? Is it in the shade? Um, if it's shaded, the water's not going to get as hot. If you've got a black barrel, uh, the water's going to get hotter than if you've got a lighter colored barrel. Uh, so how hot is the water actually getting in the rain barrel? That's going to relate to how long the water is actually going to last in there. Um, and so for my black barrels, right, black is not so good for water temperature, but I've got them um, either on a north side or on an east side and fairly shaded, or even the one on the south side is fairly shaded by... Um, tree cover and by a shrub. So mine don't get too hot and I have not noticed any issues. Um, I actually have never cleaned my rain barrels out, um, which you will see guidance out there to do that. I've never cleaned them out. I've never noticed a smell. Um, I have looked in them occasionally and I've not noticed any issues. So I think having rain barrels in shade based on my experience is a good idea for extending the shelf life. But generally the advice is going to be to try to use the water up within like a week or so. And that's what the idea that especially for a new garden, you're typically supposed to water about twice a week. For a veggie garden, you're probably watering about twice a week. So the rain comes, and then three or four days or so after things are drying up, try to use that rain barrel water up, uh, and then you're ready for the next storm. That's, that's a really good way to be using it, uh, to be using a rain barrel. Uh, and then Rochelle also asked, um, how is the pH level of the water collected in a rain barrel tested and maintained? So pH level, I am not incredibly knowledgeable about the pH level in the water. Can I flash back to my memory uh, from long ago? Um, so generally rainwater is high in nitrogen. It's one of the benefits of rainwater versus city water. Um, the rainwater that's falling through the air is picking up nitrogen from the atmosphere, especially during rain uh, thunderstorms. So there's that going for it. I forget whether or not it's a little bit basic, if it's a little bit acidic, if it's neutral. I don't remember the exact pH level of the water coming in. I will say, uh, Lara is saying it's a bit more acidic. Um, what I have seen and read is that generally rainwater is much healthier for plants than city water. City water is going to have typically a little bit more salt, more mineral content, um, compared to rainwater. So generally rainwater is better for use on most plants. Um, so that is, that's going to be, I think about the best I can do. Uh, the chump may have been stumped a little bit on that one. Uh, my apologies. Uh, Deborah Burr says, I have a DIY barrel. It is open top barrel with screen top idea to make a better screen lid than a strap. Um, I'm not sure about the strap, um, but let's, let's imagine for a moment that open top barrel um, with the screen top. So I actually got in a conversation on uh, the, the woman that manages um, uh, Ferndale's Monarch um, Butterfly Group um, has apparently been doing DIY open top barrels for several decades now and um, to great success in her experience. Uh, my concern with DIY open top barrels is always about mosquito resilience. Um, so that's partially why I took time to show that information about the screens earlier. If you're doing a DIY barrel, um, you want to really be careful to make sure that you know, if you've got the lid a little bit ajar and there's an opening for mosquitoes to get in, that's a problem. If you've used large holes in the, uh, the lid, then the mosquitoes can get through, that's a problem. And, and that notion of using a double um, window screen is going to be a good one to keep in mind. Um, that's really the, the fineness that you should aspire to, to keep out the smallest species of mosquitoes. Um, but, um, you know, she swore by, uh, an alternative way of using a rain barrel. And so I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention it here, I probably should have shown pictures. So she really disliked the idea of raising the rain barrel up. She liked it low down. She likes to be able to take the lid off and dip her water and can in there to get the water really quickly. She's impatient, put the lid back on, and then she goes about using it. The benefit of that is that you, know, you can see mosquito larva in the water. You can see these little bugs wriggling around. And through her method, you're actually, you're going to see if there's a mosquito problem much more than um, 